Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Data-Driven Economy for All, the report of the California Digital Dividend Working Group. I'd like to welcome Brent Hecht to the virtual stage to begin our session. Hey, folks. Uh, Brent Hecht here. I am a uh, professor at Northwestern University, and I will be your uh, moderator for today's panel. Um, presenting today, we have uh, three folks who have all been uh, participating in the California Data Dividend Dividends Initiative. We have Yaakov Fagan, uh, the Associate Director of the uh, Future of Capitalism Project at the Berggruen Institute. We have Nick Vincent, who is a PhD student at Northwestern University, and Hanlin uh, Lee, who is also a PhD student at Northwestern University. Um, they will be presenting uh, uh, about uh, giving a progress update on the uh, California Data Dividends Initiative. And then after about 20 minutes, we'll open things up for what we hope to be a very exciting uh, uh, question session. Um, being quite familiar with the report, I suspect it will engender um, a number of questions um, and be uh, quite provocative. So uh, with that, I will uh, turn things over to uh, uh, Yako, who will be kicking off uh, the presentation. All right. Um, oh, great. Uh, can someone else share the screen? My computer isn't letting me. Oh, no, it is. Great. Um, could someone else share screen uh, because I'm not being allowed to by my security settings? Hang on. So you want to do it or I can? Wait, yeah, Nick, why don't you go ahead and, and share? Sorry it. about that. <laughs> no, no worries, Jaco. New computer. All right. Sorry, just a sec. Got to go in uh, presenter mode. There we go. Great. How's that? Thanks. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, Nick. Um, so let's start out. Um, so just as a bit of background, we are a working group uh, that was motivated by a political event um, that was the uh, state of the uh, state of the California Governor uh, Gavin Newsom, and he had a very interesting line in the state. Uh, next slide, Nick. Oops, there it is. Um, where he uh, proposed a data dividend to share the wealth generated by personal data with the users who generate it. And our group came together as a citizens group, not connected to the governor, but as a group of independent researchers to try to examine how this might be implemented to understand both with the kind of computer science perspective of how data is being operationalized within platforms and economic perspective of how to mobilize it best in order to solve issues of inequality. Um, next slide. So our motivation was to kind of understand how these large companies generate their profits and how said profits fit into the larger development of capitalism that drives unequal outcomes. Um, next slide. There's some basic stylized facts. First of all, we know that the labor share or the share of GDP generated going to return on uh, to return on employee wages has been falling since the 1970s, with a bit of a bump up in the 90s, as you saw the first IT installation phase, and then actually an accelerated rate since then. Next one. That's a well-known fact, but a less well-known fact is actually the capital share or the return on invested capital has been falling for about the same time fairly consistently at a rate that's actually accelerating as fast or maybe now even faster than the fall in the labor share. Um, next one. What is increasing is the rise of the profit share, which just simply means the rise of profits made independent of investment, right? Or as it's called in classical economics, the rent share, right? the share of that's just related to positional power. Next slide. And we're getting some of that in what's called the productivity puzzle, right? Which is the slowing rate of growth of economic productivity and its composition. So this study was, uh, recent study is very interesting. It just shows that since the 2000s, especially since the recession, we've gotten less and less growth due to technical progress, then less due to internal investment. And most of our capacity growth comes from what's called labor quality upgrading or the increased educational level of workers. But most of that is now in the United States, at least being funded out of pocket, which is why we see such large debt burdens on households and again, such rises in inequality. Uh, next slide. And how the data industry fits in there, and we're still agnostic, I think, on whether it is the driver or a product of these arrangements is that very simply, if you look at LTM learn, uh, 
earnings, the rolling average of uh, yearly earnings, right? Moving through since 1975, you've really had a stagnation of earnings, except in one sector, which is in the U.S. data technology sector, which is just generating in terms of pure earnings way more than the rate of profit, which is telling us this is a very, very rent-driven industry. It's a monopoly, and we're arguing that the rent it's generating is coming from exp being able to access, access a previous commons, a commons that was once our interpersonal interactions. Next slide. The question is, how do we get ahead of this commodification of what was once a commons, that thing we call interpersonal data? One solution is to break up the big giants. Now, this isn't a bad solution. Some of us agree with it, some of us don't, but it might not always be an appropriate solution for a couple of reasons. One is it doesn't get rid of the structural incentives in other parts of the economy. And two is there simply in certain cases is an infrastructural advantage or return to size in data sets and collecting. And there's already an integrated set of infrastructures within these companies that you might be losing some efficiencies. Um, next slide. So, yeah, now we talk about the second solution. Um, we have the second solution, which is distributing the individual payment technology users. And this solution has been widely discussed in various news outlets earlier and has two, two, two possible approaches. Um, the, the first approach is uh, distributing some sort of per capita paychecks, such as, as a form of university, universal basic income. But based on the knowledge we know about this, uh, this approach, sorry. Next, uh, sir, next slide. Yes. Oh, sorry, uh, 2A, sorry, I was having some Yeah, lag. there you go, lag. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, based on knowledge we know, this per capita paychecks uh, is likely to give people very small amount of money. And also this approach does not correspond to the actual economic properties of data value. And uh, it does not change the structural causes of inequality that Adia Kof has mentioned earlier. And now we have this second uh, approach is to distributing some sort of meritocratic paychecks. This means that the amount of money a person receives is calculated based on the impact of this person's data on technical systems. Now this approach has its own drawbacks. First, it does not account for the digital divide, as we will talk briefly in a few seconds. And with this approach, we even run into the high risk of exacerbating existing inequalities. And last, but perhaps most straightforward, this approach creates an administrative burden to both the state and firms. Now, what, what, why should we consider the digital divide in this approach? The digital divide has persisted in the United States in various contexts. For example, there exist huge disparities in broadband adoptions across demographic and socioeconomic lines. On top of the disparity in access, digital divide is also reflected uh, in, representation, in, in the online representations of different populations in a variety of technical systems that we use basically every day, including Wikipedia and Google Maps. Now, with, with this premise in mind, what will the meritocratic paychecks look like across demographic and socioeconomic lines? My colleague Nick has done some simulation work and now he will talk about what he has found. Great, yeah, so this idea of meritocratic payments, again, just to, to recap, basically would involve the state calculating um, how much money each person receives based on the impact of their data on some technology. For instance, how much did my row in a spreadsheet affect the loss function of some machine learning model? I get a paycheck based on that. So our lab actually wanted to explore this idea. So we read some, uh, led some early simulation work where we looked at um, simulating these meritocratic dividends. And we considered a bunch of different machine learning tasks. So this is a, a single plot from the paper, uh, mapping the potentials and pitfalls of data dividends as a means of sharing the profits of artificial intelligence. It's a preprint on, on the archive um, if you want to check it out. And there's really two um, big takeaways that I just want to talk about in these, uh, these really quick slides that we're presenting today. Uh, one is that it's really, what we saw in our simulations is it's very easy to create very unequal outcomes because of the way that you transfer uh, impact to money. So the, the technique that you use to get from a loss function to an amount of money that you pay a person is very easy to create these highly concentrated, very unequal outcomes. And they could be very unequal across uh, demographic lines, which is not surprising, but very concerning. Secondly, again, returning to the digital divide, it's very easy to get a high level of inequality because of contribution disparities. Um, people do not contribute data at the same rate for a variety of reasons, uh, many of them institutional, 
And so we wouldn't necessarily expect any form of meritocratic data dividend to be in any way equal or even necessarily uh, improve economic inequality in the world. Um, so now I'm, I'm gonna launch into a little bit about how we frame this problem and how we frame the data dividend idea. And a really key but simple idea is we want to move the conversation from my data to our data. And I think this is an idea that's very much in line with many of the panels that I saw at Radical Exchange already in the last uh, you know, many hours. And the idea here is so we have our data, we have all sorts of services that are being uh, run with data. So advertising APIs, uh, all sorts of machine learning and AI models, the reselling of data, improving products. And all these things are only valuable from data of a collective, of an aggregate of people, not from an individual. And so our data is, is basically what's fueling these technologies. And we do see beta data, uh, we see benefits from that. So we get better search technologies, better maps technologies, um, all sorts of new state-of-the-art machine learning, but there's this huge information asymmetry between what the tech companies know about the value of our data and what we know, which is, which is very little. Um, and so one other thing I just wanted to briefly throw in here was that uh, data cooperatives seek to solve many of the problems that we're interested in solving. And in fact, we directly advocate for supporting data cooperatives in our work. And there was an amazing panel on this. If you didn't catch this, uh, you can maybe watch the VOD or just search all of these people individually and see their uh, initiatives because they're doing real data cooperatives right now. It's a very exciting. With that, I will turn it back over to Yaakov to talk about our whole integrated solution. Well, so our solution rests on this idea that it's not, it's the institutions that create these asymmetries, not necessarily the price levels as given. So what we want to do is create an institutional reform of the data economy. The good news is we've been there. The data economy offers many parallels with pro issues we've been dealing in the early 20th century, particularly around the distribution of electrification, electrical grids, and water. Um, next slide. And the way we solve this is through the legal doctrine of utilization, right? Which is to give utility, which is to create, give certain particular industries that have natural properties as monopolies, the right to be monopolies under strict regulation and integration with state bodies. California was actually one of the leaders of these. It founded the California Public Utilities Commission in 1912. In our report, we propose a similar commission, which we call the Data Relations Board, um, which would do similar regulation of privacy rights, access rights, and other things related to, as the California Digital Utility, uh, the, I'm sorry, the California Public Utilities Commission began in 1912. Um, but it will have other option, uh, functions, as you will see in the next slide. At the centerpiece of the regulatory power of the commission is something we call ta uh, data taxes that help with uh, wealth building. So what we propose are two taxes. One is a simple sales tax between data brokers. The other one is slightly more complicated, which you think is actually quite innovative. You don't see this in the EU proposals or any of the other proposals we've studied. And that is a data intensity tax. And essentially what we want to tax is a user base by marginal user as, uh, and remove that from the revenue with certain thresholds. Below a certain revenue, you wouldn't get a tax and below a certain user base, you wouldn't get a tax, but for every bracket you clear, much like a marginal tax, you would get a slightly increase in tax rate. And in the simulations we ran, we actually got a pretty nice marginal income curve here. So we think it'll work. And the nice thing about this kind of structure is it doesn't disincentivize you from growing your network, but it does incentivize you from not growing your network in order to hoard data for future tasks. You want to do it for particular reasons. And it also sets us up with two things. First of all, in the next slide, it helps us fund certain things we think will offset wealth inequality. Um, we've explored three options. We've explored the funding of universal savings accounts or what people call baby bonds, which is a kind of at birth access to a high yielding savings instrument with interest that you then get when you reach adulthood and you can help pay for education, housing, starting a business and many number of tasks. Uh, the second option we've looked at is the funding of education in, in order to offset some inequality, uh, in order to offset these structural inequality issues. The third is creating public IT infrastructure for greater access, and we'll get into that in the next slide. 
So our component two is much like with electrification in the United States is to begin thinking about a data industrial policy through a public data infrastructure. Now, some of that will include uh, using these revenues for creating public access for rural areas, public Wi-Fi, but we're also very interested in this idea of public data repositories that are being pi piloted now in places like Toronto and particularly in Canada. We think these have extremely strong properties that utilize data. And we want to essentially establish, give the D data relations board the ability to set the, one of these things up to start seeding them with government dynamic data, but also then create tax breaks from our previous taxes for firms to contribute privatized uh, data, data uh, and publicly useful data to these data banks in order to make them publicly available, not only to the public, but to competitors to lessen the monopoly effect. Uh, we would all, we are also believe that this uh, data that our this entity should actually be able to make a conscious decision about putting out contracts and warrants to gain new types of what data uh, data essentially new types of data sets in order to serve public in order to serve solve the public good. Um, third, and the next slide, and finally, again, following the electrification. Um, uh, parallel, we are in fa really in favor of user cooperatives, of these user data cooperatives that have been advocated already at this conference. And we think that giving firms a tax break on a per user tax from our tax uh, for every user that accesses their platform through one of these cooperatives would be a great incentive to get these things uh, started. And they really do look like how we electrified the United States in the 1930s by essentially setting up user cooperatives to build up electricity infrastructure. Um, next slide. So what we want to do eventually is to build a integrated institutional ecosystem in which a user can access a platform through a data co-op. The data co-op can give some of the publicly important data to a data trust, which will allow, share it with a startup that might pay for it in order to help the data trust going, keep going. Some tax revenue goes to public services and to, the, and to support the actions of some of this infrastructure and the user gets a, re a return back into their contribution, both through improved services, through improved services and maybe some direct wealth building mechanisms. Um, and that, that's a slide. And we, we really wanna thank, we had many, many colleagues more than on this call, both directly help write this and give us input. And I think as of today, we have launched our website with uh, some of this information, a Q, a FAQ, and soon a draft version of our report on it. All right. Yeah, let me just chime in here really quickly. So the website is coming soon. Oh, it's um, potentially within minutes, potentially within hours. Uh, we will probably tweet about that. Uh, for the time being, if anyone saw this presentation and has a, you know, a burning comment they want to get in touch, uh, I put my email address here, and then you can send it to me, and I'll forward it to the larger group. Um, but yeah, I think now we want to jump on over to a uh, panel discussion. So I will leave, I'll leave this slide up for now, I guess, unless that's annoying. Leave it up for a little bit. Um, okay. So yeah, the, uh, it sounds like the website will, uh, be, be, uh, on your, on your device, um, as soon as DNS propagation tables allow. Um, thank you for that wonderful presentation that I think described the, the report, you know, very well. Um, we now, I think, are ready to take questions from folks. We have, uh, in addition to Nick Yalkov and Hanlon and myself on the call, we also have uh, Shirag, um, Hello. <laughs> who uh, is <laughs> participating in the initiative uh, too, and there are you know, uh, several other folks who, you know, due to the hour, unfortunately couldn't make it. But we're all here to discuss uh, and answer questions. So please um, feel free to ask them. Um, in the absence of uh, you know urgent questions here, I have a couple that I think are are pretty nice to discuss. Um, I think one of my favorites is uh, is this meant to hurt tech companies? That's a question we get a, a decent amount when we talk about the the report with our colleagues. So who wants to uh, who wants to take this first? Sure. I don't think it's meant to hurt tech companies, but I think it is meant very consciously, at least when I thought of it, I know Chirag also thought of it as the economist in the group. It's meant to change the way they do business, right? Instead of, it's meant to change the incentive from, uh, from uh, trying to build these bubbles of monopoly to maximize rents to actually sharing much more like in the early Silicon Valley 
our kind of working example of how these kind of more shared information economies really work well is the early DARPA projects. So if you look at early DARPA projects, actually, they were, if you got a DARPA money, which practically every firm that you can think of that went successful did at one point in their early stages, until the mid 1980s or even the late 1980s, you were required to cede all patent rights on a DARPA funded research and actually physically publish them in order for all competitors in the ecosystem to be able to gain the information in order to gain efficiency for the entire industry rather than for an individual firm. And that actually worked quite well. This is why we have this conference in many ways, right? We wouldn't have most of the base technologies we're using right now if it weren't for these DARPA initiated ecosystems. And if I could, if I could add something uh, to what Jakob is saying as well, the way to, at least the way I conceptualize it, I'm primarily, um, I primarily study financial economics, and in in finance, one of the one of the difficult things about sort of having a common research pool is that there is a lot of capability out there in the private sector, but you know, mobilizing it or getting it to talk to itself um, between firms or between groups of firms can often be very difficult with the exception of if you have some way to convene a common research pool that isn't just, you know, getting the biggest players in the room to try and share what they consider to be trade secrets, right? What you want is a way to get everybody at the table, get them to put forward something, you know, a common standard of sort that we agree is kind of prolific enough for everyone to make use of and then get the players in the room to innovate on top of that, right? Like, and, that, and that itself is actually a highly common kind of commercialization model that's been used for a lot of different advanced tech, so not just software and computers. Good, the questions are starting to come in here, so we'll, we'll go ahead and do an audience uh, one now. Uh, Colton uh, definitely rose to the top of the queue by starting his question with Go Cats. <laughs> um, so Go Cats. Uh, I, unfortunately, there's, there's a, 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 I'm sure, a, a phone-induced typo in here, but I think I understand the, the um, the question here. Effectively, it's, it seems like data portability initiatives might shortcut the data trust. Uh, is this model relevant to portable data formats? So, I actually, yeah, I actually think the data trust would increase data portability, right? What, as Sharad hinted, one of the nice things about utility type regulation is that it forces a common standard uh, to portability. It encourages firms to actually do affordability when it might not be in their short-term interest. So one of the things we'd like to do is to have uh, use this as a kind of like uh, no, under like getting the nose on the camel's nose on the tent towards more data affordability. Makes Nick, I know you've been thinking a bit about this about data portability. You have anything to add? Yes, actually. So a couple things. So uh, hugely in favor of of data portability for a variety of reasons. One reason that we um, that we think about it in our in our research is we think that more data portability will make it uh, basically easier for consumers to leverage their the value of their data by transferring it between companies. So you could right now you can support a company by buying their products, but maybe in the future you could support a company by transferring your data to them to help their machine learning models perform better. We call this conscious data contribution, and I kind of see this working in parallel with the data trust. So the the way that we've laid out the data trust in the report, an example would be that Google wants to get a, a, a tax break on their, um, for their data that is used for Google Maps. And so they contribute some of the Google Maps data towards a data trust. Um, and this, this is a very plausible, I'm using this example because they have uh, been involved with Toronto, although I think there's some, some complications and some changes there. So maybe not the best example. All that being said, so these are kind of different types of data. So the data set that would be contributed as the data trust is not the same data that I would maybe, you know, download via my, uh, data portability tool and then contribute to a company. They're, they're on really different scales and they'd probably be actually different data formats in my mind as well, although I can't be sure. This is, this is very speculative at this point. Yeah, I, I agree, Nick. I tend to think of them as, as, as complementary, right? So one, one is intended to uh, you know, give individual access to a, a certain type of data and the other is to provide a comments for the general public. So I, which, to my mind, Wikipedia, uh, rises to the top, right? So Wikipedia is, is kind of a, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of a, a you know, public repository of extremely important machine learning information in and of itself. 
it's not something that you would get out of you know data portability initiatives. Both have their value, just it's different value. Okay, next up, um, do you folks see uh, a role for blockchain and decentralized technology um, in this initiative? I can take a quick answer. Um, we have not basically, we don't have any actual technological um, requirements that are core to the, the proposal is relatively independent of any particular implementation of a database or um, ledgers, et cetera, right now. It's, it's the proposal is actually pretty much a, uh, a relatively flexible roadmap is how I would describe it. You can correct me, uh, my colleagues, if you disagree with that. And so certainly we've speculated that perhaps blockchain could be useful in the future for especially tracking um, for data provenance. I mean, for you could probably watch other panels at this event and they will speak about that better than I will. Um, but right now we're not necessarily tied to it, but we're not uh, against it, certainly. You know, to, going back to the Wikipedia as sort of a public data trust analogy, there's you know, no need for blockchain style approaches there, but it could be that certain types of data, there might be you know, uh, useful applications for taking that type of approach. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's no API in the proposal right now, that's for sure. <laughs> um, good, or API spec, I should say. I like this next question a lot. What do you consider the biggest blocker to making this possible or to getting this adopted? So uh, does anyone, anyone have an idea that pops immediately to mind? I expect we can talk about this one for a little while. Politics, as always. I mean, yes, I mean, politics, but also scale and time. It's going to, it's a large project. And there's a lot of questions. As you start kind of getting into details, there's obviously going to be a lot of questions. But just getting the ball rolling was going to be hard enough politically. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll add to that just you know, my, my own thoughts. This proposal was designed to be the most practical possible proposal that would ha still have a reasonable impact. So that we always kept in mind, right? meeting the moment and also preparing for the future. There's all sorts of new tech that, you know, been discussed at this conference, uh, new social structures that have been discussed at this conference. Those are gonna take a little while uh, to get rolling. What we wanted to do was provide a, a mechanism to take action relatively quickly, and at the same time, you know, support those initiatives and, and the variants of those initiatives that, that Yako talked about. So the tax is pretty straightforward. I mean, the number of users is pretty straightforward, right? It, it could be, you know, Practically speaking, um, it could be done. You know, there's no new tech that needs to be invented to get this started. Um, what Jakob is saying, the, the biggest barrier is <laughs> is uh, uh, is is the politics. And the politics, I don't know. Did we, you, you know, we we spent a bit of time talking about this as a group in terms of the uh, the various. Um, you know, we have broad in broad strokes. We have various uh, you know stakeholders and and how they might think. Um, but uh, it, it, to me, to my mind, it's, it's confusing. It cuts across different groups, right? So some, like, it, uh, yeah, so it, it, it uh, is not, it is it's somewhat orthogonal to traditional U.S. or current U.S. political dynamics. At least that's what comes to mind for me. I know, um, Hanlin, did you have any thoughts? Jirag, any thoughts? Uh, Hanlin, go ahead. Oh, yeah, uh, I just, I was just thinking, like, the, the biggest question I have we often think about in mind in this is that how the public perception of this goes. Uh, like, is it if we pose the digital text, that they that would public think like this is just another like the, will the burden pass on to them? And how does the public percept like perceive data trust as a central agency to control their data? I think these are the uh, like the communication. It's more of a communication problem of a convincing like legitimizing like why this digital text is. Uh, should be implemented. So that's uh, that's from the public side of it, I'd say. Um, and if I could if I could add on to that, Hanlin, I think you raise a very good point about kind of perceptions of the tax. And I think depending on you know what your political aims are, you you might well view um, and you kind of in general, right? Like people that the, the tax has having different purposes. Uh, I played for my part. Um, a role in the report in kind of thinking through the industrial policy side. And one of the unique things about industrial policy is that it uses what we might otherwise consider standalone tools like taxation or disbursements and spending 
um, not so much just for what they on their own achieve, but kind of an ecosystem that they create for firms, individuals, groups to act in a certain way. In this case, creating a kind of better, more robust, more innovative environment for research, productivity improvements, technology and platform improvements, and getting them out right to, to the wider public. And I think one of the communications problems, but also like a political problem in getting key kind of constituent actors to buy in on this, just to convince them that like, hey, this, this isn't one, like some, just a like punitive attempt, right? To capture some value um, for some other group of people, nor is it, you know, just a classic redistribution scheme. There is a wider kind of purpose to it. And I think selling it in that way, I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily know how best to do that, but I think talking about that more forthrightly is, uh, is important because I mean, for the last 20, 30 years, kind of talk of industrial policy has receded kind of from the public domain. Hey, you know, one thing that's interesting that, that, uh, that's coming to mind is this this slide that Nick presented. Right? The, you know, Nick Hunlin and, and I are all computer scientists. Um, and, you know, through our work looking at the sort of the computing mechanisms behind many of the issues that are discussed at this conference, this notion of uh, the, or this frame of it's not my data, it's our data, <laughs> uh, keeps on coming up, right? Uh, in particular, with respect to how uh, we can change the power dynamics between the general public and, and tech companies. And power dynamics can be useful for economic outcomes, can be used for political outcomes, all, all, all sorts of things. So for me, in terms of like the communications and, and gaining that stakeholder buy-in, that, that, that phrase is not only like a, a, a saying like a, a really powerful technical a really powerful technical descriptor of what we're finding, right? It's also something that I think um, could be useful in, in um, making this possible gaining adoption, right? So you can imagine that almost a little bit as a slogan. Right? It's like, a, I don't know, about five scientific papers into a, <laughs> merged into, into a, <laughs> into a slogan. Um, anyone else have, have other stuff to add, uh, add to this, this uh, question? Um, I'll, I'll add one thing, which is I just wanted to reiterate on the, in terms of the challenge, the, the, we're still on the what's the biggest challenge question, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, to how, do we, how do we make this, how do we make it so in you know, California, say 2021, something like this is happening? Okay, yeah, so I, I would add in that our plan, we really wanted to, we, well, we have this tension between pragmatism and long-term change, and it's a good tension. It's a tension that comes about because we, this project was so collaborative and we had a lot of different voices kind of pushing and pulling on each other and, and contesting each other quite a bit. And so the report, on one hand, there's these aspects of the report that are very short term, right? The idea that we're immediately going to, uh, you know, use these tax funds to basically do wealth building, whether that's baby bonds or infrastructure or education, or if the political, um, a, the political weather is more in favor of individual payments, maybe some sort of individual payments. Um, and so that's very short term. This data relations board and the data industrial policy is very long-term. In fact, we envision the data relations board basically funding research, the kind of research that is deeply interesting to this very community. Maybe research questions like how can we use blockchain to um, do, make the data dividend better? Or maybe how do we uh, more accurately estimate the value of data? What sort of techniques do we use to figure out how much a given data set is going to improve accuracy on some task that's of public interest? These sort of things. These would be funded by the Data Relations Board. And that's like, now we're talking about kind of a, you know, a five-year time horizon, not a one-year time horizon. And so these conflicts between the really short-term aspects of the report and the long-term might make it hard to sell for some constituencies. Um, and I think, yeah, that's something where if, if folks in the audience have thoughts about how to resolve that, uh, we're always open to more critique and feedback. Yeah, the, the, uh, a core assumption that we, we uh stuck to throughout the entire drafting, right, was that we have to be very modest in, in what we, uh, in, our, in uh, uh, um, our belief that we have full information about the very complex uh, social structures ultimately involved in, in the domain, right? So the data relations board was essentially a good, uh, similar to some of the stuff that happens in, in uh, you know, environmental science, like they, that's our mechanism to make sure that at, uh, new research happens that's useful and that policy can change based on that new research. Um, that's, that's one thing I'm proud of about the proposal is that it doesn't, uh, it, it knows the error bars on what we understand. 
Um, okay, there's a fo good follow-on question. That question is, is actually uh, from an anonymous uh, question asker. Uh, is the hardest stakeholder in this uh, government, tech companies, or the public? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Wow. I'll help. I think the easiest is the public. Um, because I think that the tides are turning here. The fact that folks are starting to get interested in, in things like data cooperatives, the increasing media attention, these articles like, should you get paid for your data? Hey, did you know your data is really valuable? I um, mean, I think we're, you know, we're trying to do our part in the, uh, um, in the literature to, to kind of highlight the research findings that support that, that notion. Um, so I think that's the easiest, but the question is what's the hardest? So now, uh, I've narrowed it from three to two. Anyone else want to take a second stab? easy? I, a few months ago, I wasn't sure what would be the second easiest, but I'm actually starting to think government might be second easiest. I've been kind of involved in, in de essentially development finance for a lot of my academic career and my practitioner career when I was still, you know, trying to make money uh, as a, in the private sector. And, you know, for a while, it was just impossible to get these kind of things through. But in the last two months, the interest in active government investment and unconventional financing systems for that have has really opened up. I'm not sure if it was just the political environment or the coronavirus epidemic. It's hard to say, but I just, in the last months, the interest has gone from like zero to 60. Um, so I've become a little more optimistic. So I guess that leaves the tech companies as the hardest. Yeah, that, yeah and that's an interesting point. You know, speaking in, in general, I think uh, we've all heard this from many of our colleagues in, in the in the tech world, right? That uh, there's a lot of stress in trying. To, there, there's a lot of power in the uh, data that is available to tech companies and the um, tools that can be built on top of it. Data and people are, are uh, concerned about how to use that power ethically, right? And one thing I often say is, well, one one way to use that power ethically is to give it back to the people you're worried about. And that seems to resonate with so, some folks. Right? It reduces the stress, it reduces the uh, you know the number of possible decisions one can make. Like, should we do this, that, or the other? It's like, no, okay. <laughs> the rules are like this. You know, now we can know that we can innovate in this direction these types of things. And trivially speaking, one thing our proposal might do is incentivize innovation that uses less data or has fewer users involved in, in these types of things. And, okay, so that's clarity. <laughs> you know, it, 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 uh, it, um, which is, which is not, it's, uh, for lack of a better term, ethical clarity is something that's in, in high demand at tech companies. Um, so I think there's, there, at least in my view, there's, there's a lot of benefits there for sure. Um, Okay, another good question here is how can Radical Exchange help in this initiative aside from Matt Pruitt's uh, partnership? <laughs> that's been a that's been a ton of help. He's been in. A, I mean, he's been really like getting, we couldn't do it without Matt's uh, knowledge, <laughs> member of this group. Nick, I'm, I wonder if you want to reflect a bit on you know that you went to this conference. Is it just last year? Just last year, or a little oh, more than a year goodness. ago, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, and you, you came back. I recall being very excited and, and you know, taking taking that, that knowledge into this into this process. And reflect a bit on that. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I was I was pretty blown away. I guess uh, not to. I'm not just saying this because this is an audience, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, I really loved this conference, and I, it was a, you know maybe even in stark contrast to some of the academic conferences I had uh, attended as a graduate student. I was amazed at the you know, different backgrounds that were represented. So like art um, and, and advocacy and uh, these things that you don't see at a, at a computer science conference for sure. And I think that those perspectives are, are needed and that's something, so we don't, we have a report, you know, we have a website coming soon. Uh, we haven't really necessarily you know, thought about new ways to communicate this. And also we are always looking for more kind of perspectives on the technical side or on the, the writing side for just improving this. So. That's all a long-winded way of saying that more, more eyes will be useful. I think the Radical Exchange Network could also be really useful in terms of um, trying to advocate for this to be real. And so we started with California because the governor called for uh, interest, basically said we're uninterested in a data dividend, but we don't want to stop there. Uh, we definitely think this is an idea that would apply to a lot of other constituencies. And actually, 
Um, there's some challenges with implementing it only at the state level. So even at a higher level, maybe it would be would be useful, or you know, even a, a tech company could kind of implement their own standalone version of something like this. So all that being said, so kind of getting signal boosting the idea and working through the uh, doing the work to start to try to make it a little bit more real are some ways I see. Yeah, I, this is a an all volunteer initiative with people from all sorts of different disciplines, right? We all just kind of came together and started working. So we're definitely open to, you know, <laughs> as, as, a, as I know many aspects of radical exchange, we're open to, you know, dynamic collaboration and, and you know, uh, ideating across the boundaries that, that uh, probably would, would stand if it weren't for these types of issues and, and uh, this type of network. Good. And if I could add on that, um, I think I was at the radical exchange today and yesterday. I found that the mechanical design perspective has been really helpful in thinking of like short term, the digital text that Jacob just presented, uh, and also in the long term, the data relations board, like how do we design mechanism in that report that to incentivize tech companies to provide their, to engage with data, public data trust and data cooperatives. So, yeah. Great point. Huh? That. Yeah. I think uh, we, you know, the three of us have all, you know, done a bunch of, well, all of us have done a bunch of reading, Hanlin, Nick and I, <laughs> more day-to-day -day interaction, um, uh, you know, uh, benefited from the economic perspective that's been in the literature and community and certainly coming from uh, Shirag and, and Yaakov. Um, okay, uh, the final question on the list here is uh, also from Colton. So I was, you know, glancing quickly and, and misread his question. He was curious actually about the, um, the distributed, essentially the, you know, diaspora, Activity Pub Zot, like these dis, uh, distributed protocols, uh, for instance, associated with like Mastodon and these types of things. Do we see any role for these in the initiative? I think it's, you know, it's, it's a, like a, we take a more collective view than I think some of the, where our frame is more collective than some of the, uh, work. I, I, I could be wrong. It's too bad we can't have more of a dynamic interaction. Um, I'd be curious to see what kind of pushback there is to that. So that, that, so the, that, those types of technologies have a frame that, that's somewhat different than ours, right? We have, we have the state have a decent role, but not excess, hopefully not excessive. That's something we've talked about quite a bit. Um, and we have a, you know, a data trust that, correct me if I'm wrong, colleagues, but, uh, our, our assumption is, um, our assumption is that that would be all public, right? There wouldn't there wouldn't be any sort of privacy issues with the data trust. Um, and that, well, actually, Nick, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so not quite. There's definitely some inspiration. Again, this is an area where I'm, I'm not uh, an, an expert in this uh, kind of realm of of, of, set of similar technologies and uh, federated social media, et cetera. Um, so the data trust might can include things like uh, data that has some level of privacy concern. So you have to kind of lease it out. So it's not necessarily like everything in the data trust is, is Wikipedia. Wikipedia, you can go and read the whole revision history for any article. You can write a, a script that uses their APIs, et cetera. That's not necessarily what the data trust looks like at all. And this allows it to be in some cases more powerful because you can take advantage of data that is, has some degree of sensitivity and still get the utility. So this kind of actually connects to the privacy versus utility uh, panel earlier today about, about healthcare data, because this is a this is a, a trade off that isn't in all data. It's just most prominent or most concerning in, in healthcare data. Um, so the data trust is not necessarily Wikipedia, and that's where, for instance, the idea of kind of uh, having this network of of connections of who is allowed to kind of link up with a certain data set could definitely take some inspiration uh, from just online communities in general, kind of the ecology of online communities. Um, but we're not we're not really at the point necessarily where we are trying to lay out a specific uh, protocol for how that would work by any means. But certainly when we get there, I think we'll want to look to these technologies for inspiration. And certainly that's one way radical radical exchange community could help too, right? A great deal of expertise in these types of technologies. Um, that we, there might be opportunities we're not thinking about. Thank you, Nick, for uh, providing the necessary nuance to my overly broad to the point of, of incorrect utterance <laughs> uh, back there. Okay, so uh, I think that's that's it for questions. Um, 
and being informed that it might be reasonable to stop a bit early, allow people to have a little bit of a break. <laughs> so uh, I just want to uh, thank uh, the panel here for uh, putting together a deck, uh, uh, prepping. I got to see a little bit of, a, of uh, what that was like behind the scenes, and everyone was doing it with, as I'm sure is the case for the entire audience, lots of other things going on. Um, so uh, thanks again. Uh, please do feel free to reach out to anyone on the panel uh, with any questions at all. Uh, Nick volunteered his email address as the <laughs> as the main one, so uh, you can go ahead and ping him. And again, as those as soon as those DNS tables, uh, you know, uh, replicate in your region uh, <laughs> or or uh, whatnot, it's a, a little bit of a simplification there. Um, you'll be able to go to datadividends.org and uh, see more information about the initiative. So thanks again, and and uh, good morning, good evening, good night. <laughs> and, uh, hope to be in contact with some of you soon. Bye. All right. Thanks, everyone.